Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Equip You Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And on today's episode, we're joined by our friend and brother in Christ, Jay Warner Wallace. Jim, welcome back to the show, brother. Oh, so glad to be with you. You're, yeah. you're, you know, I always try to make room to have these conversations because they're always good conversations that kind of push the uh, the envelope a little bit. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. Try, I try. Well, can you uh, catch us up on what's been happening in your life, marriage, ministry, and any ministry projects that you're working on? Well, we just got back from uh, six weeks in Alaska with Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. They have a law enforcement appreciation program that does a marriage resiliency retreat up there. And we we started volunteering five years ago with the Operation Heal Our Patriots, which is kind of the same thing for wounded veterans. And this thing we're doing now is involving officers who are um, involved in critical incidents that either they suffer an injury or they lose a partner on, on um, you know, right next to them, or they suffer some calamity on the job that shakes them and, and impacts their marriage. And by the time we get in front of them, they're in pretty bad shape sometimes. So, so that we're just there to kind of work through some prin- basic principles of marriage, but also, a lot of folks come and they don't really know, they don't really have a relationship with Jesus. They don't really know, they haven't surrendered their lives to Christ is what it comes down to. And a lot of that is, is I always say that it's, and we get people who come up, they look, this the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association Law Enforcement Appreciation Program. So you would think, well, if you're coming to this, you're probably going to get some Billy Graham. You're probably going to hear the gospel, right? So you, but, and, and we do get folks up there who are committed Christians. They come as committed Christians. They just are struggling. They need some help, just some practical kind of help on communication, help with conflict resolution, this kind of stuff, which is great. But a lot of folks come and they've been raised in the church, yet they've never really um, made it a priority or surrendered themselves completely either to Jesus as, and it's like the language is important, right? I often say that it's, it's, it's far easier to share the truth about Jesus with people who don't know Jesus than with people who think they do. And, yeah, and, sure. you know, you can be raised in the church and you think, well, I've already heard the gospel a thousand times, but not, and because you attend church, you consider yourself a saved Christian, but maybe you've never really uh, surrendered. So how do you like voice this in a way that is um, slightly different for people who know who think they know Jesus to make sure they really understand what this means. And they haven't just accepted a cultural version. And a lot of times, you know, there are places still in the country where the Christianity is still something that people are raised with and they haven't much thought about it for themselves. So we have to kind of so I, I There was a pastor who did a video years ago and, and it's still circulating around on social media who says, I, I don't use that expression, you know, when were you saved? Um, instead, I are, are you saved? Because people, don't know what to think of that sometimes. And and even those who would say, yes, I, I got saved at 18 or I got saved at eight, don't necessarily um, know what would really have lived that way or have surrendered themselves completely to the gospel and to Jesus as savior. So he often will use this expression, is Christ alive in you? Hmm. And because this is the one worldview, which uniquely says that God is not going to um, just come alongside and fight your battles. This is other theistic systems. God is your champion. God is your warrior. God is your you know, your provider. This is a worldview that says that once you entrust your, your, your salvation to Jesus, that the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you. That's a very different kind of view of how God interacts with his chosen. And that view is what we're after is God is Jesus alive in you? Do you are you know is the Holy Spirit active? Have you completely gotten out of the way? And it's not something you can work harder at. It's something you have to work less at. You need to surrender yourself to this. This and 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 of course you don't you can't do that if you aren't thinking God's thoughts. If you don't know what the Word of God says about any number of issues, it's kind of hard to surrender yourself to God if you don't know what it is God requires of us, you know, or wants from us. Or would or the nature of God that they would, we would then emulate as God followers? So there's, there's some stuff in here that I think we need to unpack for for people who even come up who who claim a Christian identity. 
we have to unpack that for them too. So we just got done doing that for six weeks. It's always a challenge and fun and to see what God does in these marriages and to realize that all we have to do up there is do our best to get invisible just to get out of the way. And God takes it, takes over and, and does things really, you know, we often will overthink it and we'll think to ourselves, oh, this group of couples coming is going to be really tough because look at all these problems and issues and, and then and God does something to flip the script completely. And you're thinking, what was I, <laughs> did I really think that I was going to somehow be the difference maker here <laughs> when there's a holy God of the universe that um, has all the power? Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, is it, so you have to just, it's it's one of those places that shakes you a little bit out of your complacency as a, even as a leader and uh, helps you to realize that the, what, how small you are. Yeah. Um, it's humbling. So that's always good. And, you know, in the midst of all that this summer, and this is something we've done now, this is our fifth year participating in some way with this program, our third year as the lead chaplains in the program, and it doesn't leave a lot of margin. So, so we're getting ready for our 10th anniversary launch of cold case Christianity. And it's like, okay, really, when are we going to do that? Because it turns (laughs) out that, you know, if you're an author, you spend a lot of time in the first month or two of a new book release just talking about the book everywhere, you know, and, and, and I, this is the part that I hate because <laughs> you know, nobody, the fact that you're somebody, I think part of it is when you're a writer, you're probably an innate investigator and because you got to research a lot in order to be able to write, you can't just draw from an empty well. So you're constantly studying and researching and investigating the next thing you're going to write about. And and so this is what I did for my entire career is you're investigating everything that you're about to put in that search warrant. And that search warrant is going to be 250 pages for yeah. a case that's 10 years old. So you're going to have to figure out how to articulate that in a way that the judge can, can, you know, skim and then can read deeply and to, you know, he's got to read the whole thing before he can sign it. And judges don't want to waste it. You know, they want it to be concise. <laughs> they, don't, they don't want to read 250 page search warrants. Um, so you have to really, you know, learn how to write those things out. Um, and that's what we're doing, right? We're writers, but, but nobody who writes probably enjoys marketing. (laughs) I don't, (laughs) I think once I wish it was a way we could just put it out there and it would, but nobody writes a book. They don't want anyone to read. And I always tell people that anyone can write a book, getting someone to read it. That's what separates authors from non-authors today Mm -hmm. as that they were in an Amazon, you know, social media world where. You know, if you're if you're somebody who was uh, writing before Amazon, you had a very different experience with publishers and with booksellers. Now Amazon is king. Everything goes through Amazon. Probably seventy five percent of sales go through Amazon, mm. and it changes the way that you, we can even speak about. Look, there are going to be some controversial things that we need to say as Christians. That if Amazon is our funnel point, we're probably going to have a difficult future. But for now, we have to learn how to navigate that. And how do you get a book that's about Jesus in the hands of people who need to hear it? And this is what we're trying to do now, right? So this is probably what we'll spend the next two months trying to do. Yeah. And then there's another book after that, right? So there's yeah. always yeah. there's always something that you're trying to. So that's the part I hate the most. I think is I I but often when people will say, um, if I don't have to bring a book table to an event, I will not bring it mm. because the the the, the least I, I mean I just hate the idea that people would think I'm there to sell them a book. Um, yeah. That's not why we go. Um, yeah. So. But, yeah. but, the, no, but that's, that's basically the most robust view, whatever it is you're talking about, is going to be on the pages of that book because you're not going to be able to go through 338 pages of material on your presentation. So you're just going to kind of t- tip of the iceberg stuff. And then the deep dive is in the book. So you, at some point, I think we cannot move away from books if we want to deep dive. Yeah. And I think anybody who knows you would know that you're not there to sell them a book. You're there to you know bring in the gospel and to help them because you're you're thoughtful and you're focused on Christ. So. Well, a lot of this too is that, you know, what are we here for, right? I mean, um, I, I came in bivocationally and had another source of income that pays all the bills. And so this is this is like, what, how do I serve? And that's how I got involved with BGEA is that Susie was said one day, well, what are we doing to serve the church? Like, we aren't serving anymore. You're just going to speaking engagements. <laughs> I said, yeah, you're right. So what do you want to do? He said, I want to volunteer and just do tables at uh, this Operation Heal Our Patriot event in Dallas, we could fly in and get a hotel room and we could just wait tables on these veterans that have been injured. And we said, okay. So I I wrote them up and they said, yeah, come on out, but we want you to speak to our guys. And I'm like, no, 
I don't want another speaking event. They said, well, it's okay. We won't pay you. <laughs> It'll be volunteer work. And so we, as a couple went out and that's what started our involvement with this marriage resiliency. We, we are just volunteers, but it's, you know, it's six weeks off your calendar. And, you know, to think about it, it's really more like eight weeks because it takes you a week to get ready. Yeah. You travel two days before you get there because it's in a very remote location. It takes one day to get to Anchorage, one day to get to the to the lake where they have the, the, the lodge. And, you know, it's like, oh, you're gone a long time. And uh, it's just a big part of your, but boy, there's nothing better you can do in your, I'm in, I'm retired. So this is, this is what you do in your retirement. Right? <laughs> you get to serve at yeah. PG. So, Amen. Yeah. Well, well brother, sure. tell us about this book, Cold Case Christianity, updated and expanded edition. Tell us why you wrote it and how you hope it'll be received. Okay. So I'm just, I look, there's a lot of stuff that you and I could talk about. As a matter of fact, I'm sure that the publisher has sent you a bunch of lists of things you could ask about. And, and Dave, you know, we're just going to talk. Uh, I, I, last thing I want to do is answer questions about <laughs> the book, yeah. but, but I'll tell you that, um, how do you think about why would you release a 10th anniversary book? This book ended up being kind of a cornerstone book for us. We formed our website based. I used to have a website called please convince me. And that was, <laughs> our, that was our website. And uh, when I wrote a cold case, I bought that URL, that cold case Christianity URL. And I just put all the please convince me stuff, redirected it all to that URL. So now if you type in please convince me.com and come back to us, but a lot of it was I just wanted a place where I could voice the things that I had learned about Jesus that I was teaching my church and my congregation and my youth group in the years before that. And I thought, well, I'm teaching it to 50 people. And I was more than happy to teach it to 50. But I thought, why well, wouldn't I should write this up and post it and maybe another thousand people will read it and then you're reaching more people. So with the same information. So so I started posting on those websites and that's what blossomed into cold case. And when I wrote the book, it uh, started a whole new ministry life for Susie and I. And and so then why would I touch that? I mean, what it's but I saw my partner, Greg Kokel from Standard Reason, uh, had a book called Tactics, which is a great book. And I could see no reason to rewrite tactics, but when the 10th anniversary of tactics came. I think part of it is that if you're speaking about your book for 10 years, you you learn how to voice it slightly differently. And so he, re I told him, don't, if you got enough information, just write it in a second edition to tactics. But instead he went back and he rewrote tactics and it's a thicker book. It's got much more information in it and it's a better version. It is. So I saw him do that and I thought, yeah, you know, it is. Yeah. Why would you like go to part two? You, if you've learned something in the last 10 years, just you, you go back on the 10th anniversary and update your book. And that book, you know, that cold case Christianity is a pretty evergreen book. It doesn't need to be updated. Um, but there are some things like archaeology and just the things we learned on the stage presenting this material um, that you could you could redo. And I, so I was thinking about it because of Greg. And I thought, well, maybe I, I will at some point update that book. Well, then I got in the studio to do the audio version of Cold Case about eight years or so after, I can't remember how many years it was. It was well, a good time after we hired a, um, a voice actor to do the first audible version of all my books. And then when that license expired, they came back to me and said, hey, we want you to do, when you're just a brand new author, they don't know if you're going to have one book that's going to bomb. So they're not going to invest in a, you know, they're just going to have their their voice actor do it for whatever they, he charges. So I said, okay. So I redid Cold Case. And as I was reading it, now this is maybe two or three years ago, as I was reading it, I thought, oh yeah, you know, I I, I would like to say that differently. I'd like to, to go in and and I now I, I have a part of my stage presentation that would be perfect here. I should I should put I, I should have done it this way. You <laughs> know, so I started to see things. And then I was at the archaeology section and I thought, oh, we could do a much better job in that section. And and now I've got a bunch of questions that have been asked of me. And since I published this, they, they would fit in here. So it was time to, the 10th anniversary came. They were just preparing to do like a 10th anniversary cover and launch this with no additional changes. And I thought, no, if we're going to do that, let's let's rewrite it. And I always wanted to illustrate it at a much higher level, like person of interest is illustrated. And so I got to go back and, and make it now it looks like person of interest in terms of the level of illustrations, 300 new illustrations are in the book. And we did that because I thought, hey, I like a graphic version of the book. And uh, now it, it is what I had first imagined it. So it's a much different book than it was. Um, there's not a single page in which I did not make a major modification. Wow. There just isn't. I mean, I, I kept all the red ink. You know, if I made a change for the publisher, I wanted to see, I wanted them to see, like, here's what's different. Mm -hmm. So in red, these are the changes we're making on this page. Mm 
And most of the time they're paragraph changes, but if they're not paragraph changes, they are like, how do we word this in a way that's more persuasive? Because let's face it, most of the people who read our books, they're going to take those ideas and then they're going to revoice them to their friends and family. They're going to learn something. If I call this sequence, historical sequence of students and teachers, if I call that the chain of custody, well, that's a term that typically is only used in criminal trials, but now I hear it all the time and uh, the case for Christianity, the chain of custody of those documents. Well, okay, that's because we we found some expression that's memorable that we can put in that explains what we're looking at, and it actually relates to criminal trials. Well, that's the kind of thing I, there's other, other places in the book where I thought, yeah, we could make this a little more memorable. Um, so we did, we did that. And uh, now this book I think is, and, but here's the most important part, Dave. I was, I teach at three universities, right? At uh, Biola, at Southern Evangelical Seminary and at Gateway Seminary. As a matter of fact, right now we are in the middle of a class called, uh, it's case-making evangelism. Basically it's like an evangelism apologetics class. And we're in the middle of that. And when I do that class, I, a lot of it is, is, is remote. So I created for that class 30 videos that really go through the entire case, starting with truth and God's existence, reliability of scripture, the resurrection, the impact of Jesus on culture, all of it is in there. It's 10 and a half hours of video. And I require the students to to watch that in addition to a bunch of other things we do and interactive and then online meetings and all that stuff. Okay. So I had these 30 videos and I, I uh, decided this is, we need to be offer this for free to the church to be able to to at least embrace this, these concepts. And so we just created the set of PDFs for each video with all the fill-ins and all the test material, right? And a certificate you can earn. We mm -hmm. created all that. I had a research assistant named Caleb Nelson who helped me write all that curriculum. And then we now are giving it away with anyone who purchases a copy of this 10th anniversary book. So that that the idea there was how do we get the larger case? How do we get people equipped to make that case? Um, and how do we do it in a way that is visual because we're in a visual culture. So this case making course, I think does that. And, um, it's available for anyone who purchases the 10th anniversary. And I, you know, people would say, and I, I had several people in apologetics world who said, well, you should put that online as a course that could be an online course. Well, I'm not going to charge for it. And I don't want to have to charge even the hosting fees. Like I already have a, a web host that I can put this on. <laughs> that they could download it from. It's not great, but it's good enough. And it costs me nothing and it'll cost them nothing. So now I've got people uh, starting yesterday was when we launched the book. And so now we've got people downloading the course. And my hope is that, that will that, you know, 10 years from now, there'll be a bunch of people who will at least be able to articulate and have it in their mind's eye, visually the memory of the case for truth, the case for God, the case for the reliability of scripture, the case for the resurrection, the case for Jesus. All of that stuff is hopefully now more memorable for them. Because yeah. in the end, you know, as I get older, I'm thinking, okay, what, what's the point of all this? Why do we do all this? What was the impact? For, well, we're hoping to help people in their marriages right now up in, up in Alaska. And we're hoping to help people walk in their faith, you know, in their confidence. What's yeah. interesting to me is that word hope that you see in scripture, that Greek word for hope, I need to pull it up, um, is not a word that means what it means to us in English. It's a much um, paler version of the expression in English. In English, it kind of really means, well, I, I'm, I'm wishing for it. I'd like for it to happen. So if you said, you know, um, do you think that the Rams will win on Sunday in the opener? Well, I hope so. No. Yeah. Go Seahawks. <laughs> Go Seahawks, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So it's a, do you hope the Seahawks will win? Or do you think the Seahawks will? Well, I sure hope so. So, okay. Well, that, what does that mean? It, it, means, it means really that, Especially in like a game like okay, I, I've got fantasy football coming this weekend. Okay, so the, the the Chiefs are playing the Detroit Lions, and I've got two Chiefs on my fantasy team. Okay, so the question is, well, this is a, a tough call. You you, yeah. you hope so. You hope yeah. they'll win. Yeah. But it's not like I have like ugh, I know they're going to win. I know because there's no way they cannot win based on this information I have. Well, that's the kind of hope that's in scripture. It is the clear confidence based on your prior experiences or what you know about God. That is the kind of confidence that we are to have when we use the word hope. But now in our generation and in English language, hope doesn't mean that at all. It means wishful thinking. You know, I, I kind of hope so. Well, if we want to have biblical hope, that comes with the level of certainty that has to be grounded in something. It's not blind. It's not blind. 
it, it's that it's that Thomas has the hope of the resurrection because he put his hand in the or he 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 asked to put his hand in the side of Jesus. He saw the risen Christ. That was enough for him. Yeah, and that gave him the confidence and the kind of biblical hope, which is grounded not just in well, you know, I don't know for sure, but yeah, I hope so. Yeah, it's grounded in no, I know, I know because my hope is placed in something I am. I've got. I had an experience that I I know. And I think a lot of us, if I'm honest, are, have a high value for evidence. And if you, and I didn't, I, this took me probably 10 years to figure out because when I first started, I thought, why don't, why doesn't anyone care about, why don't Christians care about the case for Christ? Not the book, but I mean, just the case in general. Like, why don't, why don't Christians give a lick about apologetics? And they uh, largely don't. Well, what, what, so what is they, what are they putting their trust as? In other words, is it something, are they just more, uh, holy than I am in the sense that they don't need any any reason to believe. They just have been told that if you believe, you will be saved. And so they have this, this heartfelt um, desire to obey God, and, and that's what God honors then. Okay, so is that what it is? Because that's the case. I don't feel like I'm a very good Christian because I'm somebody who followed the evidence. But as you talk to Christians and you ask them, why are you a Christian? It's not that they say, well, I just know from scripture that I don't have to have a reason. I just know they will instead say, well, let me tell you this little story about four or five things that happened in my life that I thought there's no way that's a coincidence. That is God moving. I had this experience and now here I am over here. So I know there's a God because of what happened to me. So what are they? they're absolutely evidentialists. They are just looking at direct evidence, their own direct experience of what they believe is God working in their life. So it's not as though they're any less evidential than I was, but I wasn't looking at the evidence of my experience because I didn't trust my experiences. I was looking at indirect evidence of everything else that I could assemble a case with, which is what I talk about in cold case Christianity. But everyone is an evidentialist, really. It's just what is it you're counting as Mm -hmm. evidence? Most people will say that uh, they experienced some transformation. They consider that evidence. They prayed for something that they received. They consider that evidence. They were sick. They got they got healed. They consider that evidence. And and then the only question here's my my biggest rub is well yeah that's what every Mormon says though too. Mm -hmm. They're Mormon because they had an experience that demonstrated the Book of Mormon is true and Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. Well again you you got to test your experiences your direct evidence with the set of indirect evidences that'll make the case for whether or not that experience you had was from God. Because if you don't do that, you could just as well end up as a Buddhist or a Mormon or a Hindu or anybody else who says they had as their evidence an experience that confirmed for them that their worldview was true. That's confirmation bias too. Yeah. And a lot of it is. And I just didn't trust, I don't trust anybody, including myself. I didn't trust my own experiences. I mean, but at the same time, that kept me from seeing the things of God for many years. In other words, every time I could have seen something and go, whoa, I would have said, that's a coincidence. <laughs> I would have said, that's what a, what an interesting coincidence. What? Oh, yeah, well, of course you got, you know, did you go to the doctor? Well, of course, his treatment cured you. Like there was nothing I would have attributed to God because I had a confirmation bias about naturalism, right? There's if it if it's a if it's a coincidence, yep, coincidences happen. Strange one-offs happen all the time. <laughs> that was a one-off. You know, I would have I've, I've always attributed it to something else. So so you can have that bias on both directions. So I just but for I think this is why it's important for me, especially with cops, because cops are are very uh they're case makers from start to finish. I don't know if you've ever thought about cops, but cops are out there patrolling in their patrol car. And they see something drive by and they're like, well, they're making a case in their head because they have to have probable cause to even make the stop. And they have to say, okay, so what my report's going to say this, because this is what I just saw. Okay, great. They're making a case in their head for their future report. Pull the car over. Okay. He's talking to the guy. Ooh, I smell some marijuana. Whatever it is, you, what, am I going to get this guy out of the car? Why? On what basis? On what grounds? I'm making that case in my head. I'm going to have to write that down later. Then eventually you make an arrest. And well, why did you make an arrest? Well, it's because these things happened. This, these conditions were met. Okay, well, I'm making that case in my head. It's going to be on a report later. I got to go to the DA to file the case. Oh, really? Why should I file this case? I have a report. Here's all the conditions that were met. Okay, great. We're trying to file it. Good. Now we're in front of a jury. What am I doing? It's case making from the moment you put your eyes on what it is you're about to do all the way through trial. These are case makers. Yep. So case makers typically want you to make a case. <laughs> so, so that's why we take this approach 
with everything we do. And that's why we take an approach like this in the in, in cold case Christianity is we're trying to to make that case available to others, right? That's, so that's a lot of what we do. And I, I took a lot of pushback from people who, who, for theological reasons, don't think this is an appropriate. And I, I listen, one thing that apologists do is we spend a lot of time um, making a case, laying the foundation for why Christianity is true without ever preaching the gospel. Most of the time when you see one of us come to a, to a, a conference, it's not to preach the gospel. We're coming to the conference to make a case for why this book is early or why this reliability of this is, you know, what why the resurrection is a good inference, whatever it may be. Very few of us are there to preach the gospel. As a matter of fact, a lot of us will say, yeah, I'm not really there to preach the gospel. I'm there to lay the foundation that later on, I'm, you know, just, just plant a seed. Well, when you work with Billy Graham Association, you realize that there's no power in planting the seed. <laughs> the gospel is the power of God. In the end, if I don't get to the gospel, that's the thing that saves. So it's gospel centered right now. Granted, I'm going to make a case because I I, I got to speak a language that these belligerent case makers speak. Well, and that's a lot of the world right now. Yeah, think that they're belligerent and they think a case case needs to be made first. So once I make that case and knock those walls down, well, guess what? I have a clear path now with the gospel because everything that would have prevented you from paying attention to it, I've now removed. Now we can talk about about being saved. Yeah. Well, there's some people that have an issue probably more on the reform side like I am, they have a problem, you know, because they they believe in dealing with presuppositions and what they don't understand and something I'm always tell them. And I'm, I'm a presuppositional guy. I think that we need to deal with behind why people people are saying and what comes out of the mouth and all those things. And, yeah, I agree. And, and those kind of things. But that doesn't mean then then that we never deal like you're saying with evidence. And I just want to say when, when in this book the, I read this edition and the previous edition, you do lay out evidence, but you deal with it at the worldview level. You mm -hmm. deal with it because you understand and you're very clearly articulating to people that, hey, you have a worldview. This is the worldview. This is where that worldview leads. It's not going to lead you to the truth. It's going to lead right. you away from the truth. And then here's the evidence that you're giving. So somebody might think, oh, well, you know, Jim is just talking about evidence or whatever. And I just want to say that knowing you, reading this book, I've read the first edition, I read the second edition. That's that's not where you're at. That's not what you're saying. Um, so anybody that would hear you talking about the evidence with, you know, all, all those other things, I just want to say, I like, this is this is not Jim, and that's not what the book is doing. The book is laying out a, a worldview analysis, a very fine worldview analysis, and then it's coming alongside and laying out the evidence. And there's there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you think that only dealing with the presuppositions, the the thing, the convictions and the beliefs of somebody, and then you never present evidence, like that's the part where I think you have a problem. Um, you know, I I think that if you have a more balanced view and perspective, like like we do. I think that's more helpful for people because um, then you can deal with actual arguments. You can deal with actual mm -hmm. um, statements, and then you can bring the Bible to bear um, on on the particular statements and the convictions, as you do in this book. Um, you know, and your other books as well. You're you're bringing God's word to bear on people's hearts and lives so that they can know Christ, as you beautifully said, revealed in the scriptures. So. Well, you know what's interesting about that too is I, I'm a both end guy, and I know that just makes people crazy if they think that there can't be a both end. If there's lots of folks who are committed to the idea that there's a, this is an either or proposition, you can take an evidential approach or you can take a presuppositional approach, but you can't take both. And of course, we always take both. I mean, there's no doubt. I'm actually far more interested in the presuppositional approach because I just love the, philo the philosophical foundations for these things. Uh, this is why we make inferences. I mean, the two people can sit in the same jury, look at the exact same evidence and come to two completely different inferences because they have presuppositional biases that start off in the wrong directions. So uh, there's no doubt that the work we do in jury trials is first an examination of presuppositions. That's called jury selection. And then a display of the evidence is that's called the trial. So we're doing both of those things. You have to do both of those things. But I actually see all of it as evidence. Like, I don't even think there's a presuppositional category. Here's why. What are we presupposing? 
we're presupposing that the scripture, we're presupposing that the Christian worldview is true. Well, how do you know what the Christian worldview is? Well, we're getting that from the scripture. So in essence, we're presupposing that the scripture is true. But what is the scripture? It is a set of eyewitness accounts. That's called direct evidence. Right. So you're presupposing evidence. It's all evidential. You can't get away from it. You, you can't because the thing you're presupposing is a claim made by an alleged eyewitness or like Luke, somebody who is writing for the alleged eyewitnesses or like Mark, somebody who is writing allegedly for Peter, according to Papias. The point is you are stuck with this. You, you cannot get away from it because we are in a world that is grounded in our direct and indirect experiences. It's in our direct observations of things and we talk to each other about those, or it's in inferences we draw from all the indirect stuff. You know, in a criminal trial, this is how they will say it in California. They will say, and this is why you can, this kind of helps sometimes think about the two differences. The only thing that counts as direct uh, uh, evidence is eyewitness accounts. Now, if you have your glowing rectangle and it's got a nice camera on it, well, then that video would also count as direct evidence because it has an, it's an eye that observes something and then retells it. That's what a witness is. He has an eye that sees something, then he retells it or she retells it. Now, what's interesting in the jury instructions, I'll put it this way. The judge will say, as an example of direct evidence, if, for example, uh, somebody came into the courtroom today and walked over and told us that I was just outside and it's raining outside, you could properly infer from that testimony that it's raining outside. If if, if that uh, if you test the witness and he passes the tests, and we talk about those tests in cold case Christianity. So that's direct evidence. He comes in and tells you it's raining outside. On the other hand, if you didn't talk to anybody, but you saw the door open from outside and in walks somebody with the rain jacket on and he's covered in rain and he shakes off the water and he closes an umbrella and he puts it in the rack and somebody else comes right after him. And same thing. He's, his hair's wet. He's, he's, you know, he's got the umbrella, he closes it and puts it in. You can properly infer from the indirect evidence of those observations you just made that it's raining outside. So you got to the same conclusion two different ways. Now you could argue now one thing about indirect evidence is there's always a different inference. It's possible, but it's not as reasonable. So in indirect evidence, you might say, well, how do I know he didn't walk through a sprinkler? Hmm. That's why he's dripping wet. Well, did he anticipate the sprinkler? So he put on a rain jacket and brought an umbrella because he was anticipating he might have to walk through a broken sprinkler. That's possible, but it's not reasonable. And that's the difference between direct evidence and indirect evidence. I like indirect evidence because it requires you to use your brain. <laughs> You know, this is why juries are often told that in order to reach a verdict, you're going to have to use your common sense. Well, you don't really need common sense if you've got 20 witnesses telling you something, but you will need common sense if you're trying to infer properly about indirect evidence. So so I think in the end, we this is what we all do re regarding any claim, including claims about God, because it turns out that you could make a case for God. Let's say there's no scripture. And you're just going to make a case from the battle of worldviews. And you're going to have a theistic worldview and argue this makes the best split, uh, sense of. Now, remember, though, what you now just imagine with me, there's no scripture. There's no Christian scripture. Well, now you really are doing the presuppositionalist position because you don't, you're not relying on anything that could be considered evidential. But scripture by its very nature is evidential. And if you're going to rely on that for your presupposition, you're back to evidentialism. Just, to, just to, You're just on a different leg of the evidential project. And so I've always seen my, and I often will slip into this. Well, let's just think out though, how your worldview would account for this phenomenon we're talking about and how deficient that is compared to what I love. The next book I'm writing is about biblical anthropology. It turns out that the way we are and how we thrive based on every modern survey and study that's been done in the last 50 years does nothing but con but confirm biblical anthropology. Mm. The, the, we're not finding anything new on these pages of these studies that wasn't there 2,000 years ago on the pages of Scripture. Nothing new under the sun. As a matter of fact, the more we learn about human flourishing, the more we can trust what the Scripture says about humans. Our biblical worldview even makes sense of our experiences. Hmm. So I love the idea of, but again, how am I going to demonstrate that to you? I'm going to use some evidence. Evidence not from scripture, evidence from your secular studies. Then I'm going to show you that that's been on pages of scripture for years. But by the way, that's not even the same uh, view that maybe uh, other theists might hold. But we happen to hold a view about about our uh, behaviors, about our um, worship, what we worship, about our humility, about... Uh, the balance between justice and, and truth, 
about marriage, about fatherhood, these things, these, these classic kind of fuddy-duddy old fundamental <laughs> beliefs about how we interact with each other. It turns out that if we adopted those without even knowing they came from Christianity, <clears throat> we would be flourishing at a much higher level as human beings. And the studies show that, even the secular studies. So the point is, I, I, it's, it's it's both end to me. I, I think yeah. that I want to be involved in both projects. Yeah, I want to be in, and, and, me too. and sometimes I never get in off of one side or the other, depending on who I'm talking to. This whole thing can be a foundational philosophical foundation kind of question. Yeah, or it can be the whole thing can be like with your Mormon friends. They believe that their presuppositional views about God are the better explanation. And to be honest, they're often confused. So when you're talking to another Mormon about worldview issues they've adopted christian views it's like you're talking to between two christians they don't you have to remind them of no that's not actually what your book teaches <laughs> that's yeah. not actually what your system teaches they're thinking yes it is they don't they think it, they've adopted all the christian views in terms of like the, the conversation between the two of you well now you can turn a good corner if you're an evidentialist because it turns out that you're basing all of your views though on a book for which there is no evidence that any of what it said actually happened. Yep. That's the problem with the Book of Mormon. Um, you know, there's a, a, entire people groups that allegedly lived for a thousand year history that's recorded on the pages of the Book of Mormon from 600 BC to 400 AD on the North American continent. Those are some broad, bold claims. And if those claims are true, we should at least find some evidence that these groups lived, that these cities were established, that these monetary systems were used, that these weapons existed, that these animals even roamed the North American continent. And none of that stuff's available. And so that's why at that point, when you're talking to a Mormon, even as a presuppositional apologist, you're going to quickly become an evidentialist because you're going to find that your presuppositions are going to go, uh-huh, we agree. Uh-huh, we agree. Uh-huh, we agree. And you're going, wait a minute. I know enough about Mormonism to know you don't agree, but that's not who you're talking to today. You're talking to somebody who thinks you do. Right. So you're kind of stuck at some point having to take a turn. And that's why yeah. I think it's good to have it's a both end approach. Yep. You kind I of agree. rabbit trailed quite a bit on that one, David. That, that was good. That was that was okay. That was okay. <clears throat> you know, we're we're facing challenges all across the board, as we both know, and we we both talk about these things. Um upon the authority of scripture there mm -hmm. there's so many challenges um if i was to detail them we'd be here much longer so i won't do that but i think one thing just to tie that all in what you were talking about the both and approach like you were saying we 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 deal with arguments you know you you see that um you know like in my in my books and your books as well and then and then we bring the scripture to bear because we believe that the Bible is truth, but yet we're living even in a in a time when our young people um, are being heavily influenced by guys like Bart Ehrman and mm -hmm. and other people. And it seems to me, and I'm and I'm sure there's other people who have said this as well, but but doubt is something of a virtue. It's it's kind of right. uh, cool, and it's like, but but wait a minute, if we can know truth, like you're saying then there are actual answers to deal with that. So the question is, I guess, why do people then get stuck at, you know, following the Bart Ehrmans and the, these guys over and against when we have good answers? Why why do they stay there? And why? what can we do then to help them to to stop following somebody like a Bart Ehrman and other people? Yeah, good good question. And I think, now, look, I, I'm going to mention somebody who maybe it, I, I've i been talking about this guy for about six months now. And every time I bring him up, sometimes online, people will beat me to smithereens as if I agree with every single per. you know, there's, there's no one on planet Earth, apologist or theologian or anything. Wait, you else. don't agree with me, Jim? Well, of course oh I do <laughs> on, on all the essential most, right? But, <laughs> but kidding, you know, bro. there's going to be stuff on all of us that we're going to say, yeah, I'm, a, I'm with him on all the things except for that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. which is fine. Yeah, yeah. But I think that, that this is one of the things that I think that Tim Keller did a good job. I mentioned Tim's name because, you know, he's passed this last year, he passed away. But he did a good job of contextualizing for an audience that he needed to turn from where they were 
to where it is you hope to bring them. And a lot of people will look at Tim Keller's work and they'll say, yeah, you know, he's, he's, I don't agree with him on this, this, or that. Okay, fine. I don't agree with myself on most things. So I'm, I'm over that already. <laughs> the question is, can you contextualize this though for a very difficult audience in New York City that thinks they know more than the stupid pastor? Because they always think the pastors are stupid. And, you know, when you find out that the guy you're ta- who's talking actually has read all the books that you've read, knows everything that you know, and it still believes that Christianity is true, then you have a sense, well, I think that the, the, our kids need to see that. They need to see that we are not believers because we have buried our heads in the sand and are not listening to what the world is saying. What's persu- persuasive, I think, for difficult groups is that you know their material better than they know their material. And then then you can say, yes, and in, sp- and in spite of all that, I am a believer because this makes the best sense of the world. I understand the worldview of all those folks you're reading, and I, I simply reject it because it doesn't work. And and that's a far better place to be. And that's one of the things that Tim did was he he kind of knew who he's talking to. And he could now you could now look, for me, what stops us, and he often said this, he would say things like, you know, you need two things, you get their attention. He would talk about in terms of evangelism in a noisy world. This is 20 years ago he was saying this. And then you need to make it's about attraction. Wouldn't it be amazing if this worldview was true? In other words, I'm not going to suggest yet in our discussion that Christianity is true, but boy, if it was, wouldn't this part of it be amazing? Like, is it attractive? This is what I think that young people are struggling with and why they, it's not so much, is it true? Is, is it good? Is it beautiful? And they are being convinced by the world that love is love. And these things are, you know, and there's, there's beauty over here and that's where real beauty is. And this is repressive and misogynistic and homophobic and there's no goodness over here and that's why i wanted to write a book the next book to talk about hey you know what wouldn't it be amazing if christianity is true and it turns out that it appears to be that you could flourish much higher at higher levels if you simply did what christianity suggests there is some some evidence in there uh just kind of sideways if you look for it but the point is is that i want our young people to see well wouldn't it be amazing if this was true and that that's a matter of us seeing what is so attractive about christianity and leveraging its attraction for people who are been wooed by the world and they think the world is attractive mm-hmm. that's especially true of young people and i think for a lot of folks the reason why they're not trusting scripture is that of the two options i could trust scripture and lose all these things that i find beautiful and meaningful because I've been wooed by the world, and I'm not going to do that. Or I could say, oh, oh, really? So it turns out that your long-term flourishing is not going to be made better by that route you're on. But if you had a conservative view, which is well on the pages of Scripture, if, uh, not politically conservative, I mean a, a conservative view about even your own humility. Because right now, the world is saying, everyone can be an influencer. Everyone can be a star. You're famous. Everyone's famous. Okay, if everyone's famous, no one's famous. Okay? Yeah. The reality is that, that, and it turns out, that that's not where your identity should be. It, w- wouldn't it be amazing if you could be at peace with who you are? Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, you could be. That's in the Christian worldview. You're going to have a hard time finding that in the secular world. Amen. So, so that's the kind of stuff that I think that we have to work on. And but look, in the end, if it's not true, it really can't be beautiful. I'm not interested in a a, a useful delusion. I'm not interested in making something up to have a good life. I want to find something true to have a good life, and that's why we spend time making a case for the reliability of Scripture. Because in the end, if you don't believe this is really true, why would you trust it? Yeah. Because the first time you bump up against truth, it's not going to work, right? Right. Well, I'd rather have the truth. And the first time I bump up against any lie, where I'm at is just fine. And I have to kind of hope that that's, that's what we're trying to do with any of these books, that anyone writes, making a case for the Christian God, making a case for the reliability of scripture. Really good, brother. Well, you know, there's, uh, where can people go to find out more about you on social media or otherwise? Yeah. And I said, let me say something controversial about that too, before we get off the air with each other. Oh we, we've already tipped over enough sacred cows here. Let's let's try to. <laughs> I, I actually think that, and I'm on social media, and I'm on social media because I write books. And right now, there are no publicists that are going to tell people about your books. This is a content marketing world, and publishers just want to know if you can sell your book. 
Yep. I hate it. Okay. So it turns all of this, our efforts to marketing efforts. And to me, that's very unattractive. But I will say this. I think that what's killing us as a culture is social media, not the internet. It's social media and how we interact with each other on social media. So in some ways, because I don't put a lot of personal stuff on social media, I just talk about what it is I'm thinking about and what I'm writing about and what I'm speaking about right now. Yep. I posted a picture of my wife and I on social media yesterday for the first time probably in years because I just want to protect the privacy of there's, there's better ways. If you know us, you know us. Um, if you're on social media, yes, the, the different kind of, yes, people we know are on social media, but most people are not on, I don't know those people on social media. So I think we have to be really, really careful as a culture, especially as Christians going forward to help our kids limit. Yes, take advantage of what the internet offers, but your social media use, we're going to figure out a strategy with that because opening ourselves up to the kind of screaming that's happening right now on X and on other media platforms, even Facebook, right? That screaming back and forth about politics is not, or whatever it is, is not helpful, I don't think. And I think yeah. it's making us more and more polarized to the point where we don't even look at candidates now that aren't polarizing. Yep. There are lots of good candidates that aren't polarizing. They don't make it past the, the first couple of, uh, of debates. The polarizing ones rise to the top because we're in a polarized, screaming internet world. Yep. Social media world. So, yes, I'm on social media, but forget about that. Just find us over at coldcasechristianity.com because that's a quieter version of what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. The social media version of what we're doing is loud and obnoxious, not from us because this, that environment is loud and obnoxious. And I think for the, the better kind of quieter paced version of what we're trying to do to influence the church, you can find that at coldcasechristianity.com. That's that's a good. Um, and by the way, we have for the flip of that. That's a Christian worldview looked at through a detective's lens. The opposite, a cop world, a cop world looked at through the, the lens of a Christian. That is called the thin blue life dot com. The thin blue life dot com. That's really good. Well, brother, just as we wrap up uh, the, this conversation today, can you give us a few takeaways? Yeah, here's what I would say. Um, if you're out there and you're a Christian, and you're a believer, and you're looking to um, grow as a believer, uh, take advantage of all the stuff that's free, because there's a ton of stuff that's free. It's available to you for nothing before you ever spend a dime. We just did a podcast. This podcast is going to cost you zero. So take advantage of the stuff that costs you zero and leverage that, right? And control what's going in your head. I mean, right now it's football season is going to start. And so I'll tell you as a sports fan, uh, you really? I just I gotta make an effort not to have my entire uh, consumption of media be about football. Um, that's gotta make that guilty effort. here too, brother. Guilty. Yes. Here. Okay. <laughs> exactly. I'm so, with you. <laughs> okay. So we have to be as guys. We have to kind of think. Okay. What What is the our prior where our priorities lie? But there's so much available to us as Christians online, and you need to be. I just found two new apps yesterday that I thought were uh, decent apps to kind of get you through the Bible in a year that I can use with, with Susie at night before we go to bed. We just put this on for 20 minutes and we we're able to kind of chart through scripture together. You know, use the media to do what it is that you are prioritizing already. And if you aren't prioritizing that stuff already, just change your priorities. But I would say that, you know, we write these books not because we're trying to make a dent as, as authors as much as we are trying to provide resources to turn the church so that we are better equipped to defend what's true. And if you can get a lot of that for free. We've got a thing over a thousand pieces of content on our website that are free. Um, you know, read the stuff that's out there uh, eight, before you go spending money on stuff. We got, we got about 8,000 on Servants of Grace. So, Oh, that's amazing. Wow. So All free. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's what's great, but these are all searchable um, websites. And so there's a lot of stuff that you could, here, here's the thing, you're already, consuming free content online but i bet it's not a god or christian content right i yeah. mean you know we just picked our fantasy football team i can't tell you how many websites i had to read through to, to make those choices really yeah. really i mean, yeah. think, I, mean <laughs> I, when I got done I, I i picked my team and i didn't get everybody i wanted anyway and i'm looking at it, i'm thinking what did i just spend two days on this is so <laughs> stupid okay but and we all do it and got it's a, not that it's something else i got a funny story my wife did fantasy football my wife if you knew her she's she don't know her very you don't know her but she when she was working that when we were in california she did a she did a uh her at where she was at edwards air force base 
they had they did she did this is hilarious she did fancy football with the guys and they're like they asked her sarah do you want to and so she comes to me and she says right. i never do fantasy football but i i know so much about football my wife says and sports in general you should have a podcast for sports well oh, anyways my wife so anyways, the exact same thing so so the funny thing is so she she beat all the guys there and she got them all right um for i don't know weeks and weeks because I said, no, you need to pick this one. You need to pick this one. Right, right, and right. And she's beating all the guys. She's like, how do you do that? Well, I don't know if she told him, but it was it was funny anyways. Well, and that's just all that. That's the way my Susie always says in the off season. What are you doing? You're listening to shows that just all sports gossip because it's not even in season. It's like, <laughs> who's going to get traded over there? Who heard this and who heard that? It's all sports gossip. And she's right. But that's the stuff that, look, in the end, here's my encouragement. I fill your head with the stuff that's important to fill your head with. Don't don't give up. That's you only have so many thoughts you can think in a day. How many are you actually thinking? You know, if you want to know what it is you're worshiping, let me see how you're spending your money, and let me see your calendar, and let me get, get a hold of your thought life. Yeah, then we'll really know what it is we're worshiping. So Amen. that's what I encourage you. Yeah, get your priorities down. Like and that's an encouragement for me because I don't, I'm just as bad as anybody else. Yeah, that's true. Really good, brother. Well, guys, uh, we've been talking today with uh, Jay, my friend Jay Warner Wallace about his new book, Cold Case Christianity, Updated and Expanded. I encourage you to go and pick this up. You'll be helped and blessed by it. And uh, do check out Jim's YouTube and his podcast, Cold Case Christianity. Um, it's free. So why wouldn't you, like you said? So, Jim, thank you so much for joining me, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate you. Thank you. You too. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.